it's good to have a lot of locations in a sandbox. It's awesome. Uh, but if they're not connected to each other, if there's no sort of interconnectivity to this, you don't really have a skeleton or a framework. You just have a loose nebulous clouds of here's here's the goblin village and here's the crashed spaceship and here's the, um, you know, ancient uh, fort fallen to ruin occupied by pilgrims. Uh, but if you start drawing hooks between all of these places, uh, then you rapidly make a interconnected feeling place. Hi, welcome to the Daiku Podcast. I'm Gary Snow, and joining me today is Joel Hines, the creator behind the indie game studio of Silver Arm Press, who's created the Desert Moon of Karth, abilities considered unnatural, the Secret of Black uh, Crag, and Tide World of Manny, which is set to launch very quickly. We'll talk all about that. But uh, first of all, Joel, welcome. Hi. Yeah, thanks. To, glad to be here. Uh, big fan of the show. And um, yeah, uh, to, and then to, to clarify a shout out, uh, the, the author on Secret of Black, Black Crag is uh, Chance Dudenak there. And oh. um, so I, I co-authored um, Abilities Considered Unnatural with uh, Danny Liebster, but uh, co co-wrote that one. Yeah. Well, we're... We'll give you all the credit through uh, Silver Arm oh, Press, which is which is uh, the the game studio name. And uh, as we talked about prior to the start, uh, people sometimes go, "Okay, what's the game studio and what's the person?" So it's going to yeah. be really nice to get to know the person behind the studio. Sure. Uh, so just I guess obviously we always start off with the question of like, uh, how did you get started in the whole uh, hobby in the first place? Mm -hmm. So I I got into RPGs and. Um, uh, I guess late elementary school. Uh, I don't know where the genesis was, but about 3.5, I'd, I'd buy a bunch of the books and read through them, and I couldn't find anyone to play with. And that was basically my experience with D&D for a number of years growing up uh, before I, I'd play occasionally, uh, like one or two games in middle school. Uh, but I never really... Um, it was all sort of that lonely fun, right? And uh, until I got into college, I played a, a couple games. I was like, oh, this is really cool. Um, but I, I was distracted by other, you know, work and other fun stuff in college. So I didn't really get into it, uh, until, uh, I graduated and, um, then got a couple campaigns going, uh, with 5e and really was in, enjoying it. Uh, and then from there I stumbled across the OSR because I was looking for more niche, uh, stuff and really liked the play style. And so I, I got into, um, Stars Without Number and DCC and OSE and, uh, then, most recently Mothership, and uh, I've been really enjoying it, and it's great. It's a good time to be alive and playing RPGs, for sure. It's definitely a golden age, I think, of uh, role-playing game and design and just so many uh, different diverse games of all like sorts, and you can get them at a moment's mm -hmm. notice. There's just a plethora of like games that you can choose from uh and going to that realm like desert moon of karth it's a mothership uh sandbox setting i think it's uh adventure sandbox setting but why did you choose uh mothership to get started in, in the first place like did you mm -hmm. did you first discover mothership and the third party licensing and just go this is what i'm supposed to be doing yeah that's definitely part of it so i originally um Got, when I was seeing all these uh, these cool uh, RPG products, originally I thought like, wow, someone who writes a book that I enjoy, they're probably very inaccessible, right? Like uh, they're, they're somebody who's far removed from me. It's like talking to a famous movie star, right? It turns out nobody's a famous movie star in, in the RPG. Uh, there's, there's, you know, definitely niche famous people, but nobody's super unapproachable or like, uh, or hard to reach out to and talk to. So when I found out that these are just normal people doing stuff um, and making these Kickstarters and uh, various cool books, I was like, wow, maybe I could do this. So I, my initial plan was to make something for Stars Without Number, which I was running a campaign of at the time. And I had um, actually been using some Mothership modules, the uh, first party Dead Planet ones, uh, using that system uh, because it was what I was familiar with. But then um, as I uh, started playing a little Mothership and also looking into where people's, uh, I guess, interest were. It turns out everyone who plays Stars Without Number is used to uh, just hacking together things from every system. And uh, they are very uh, omnivorous in their their tastes. And it's um, uh, it's hard to know the number of people playing, but they'll, they'll take from everywhere. Whereas Mothership has 
uh, people do adapt things a lot, but there's a lot of um, uh, enthusiasm for the system and uh, stuff specifically for it, which does have its own um, uh, game design elements. And it's also very light to design for, which is nice. So my original plan of making like a 300 page desert moon hex crawl for stars without number uh, would have been a uh, incredibly, uh, it would never have gotten done. That's too huge a project for a first project for me at least. And so um, the limitations of fitting that zine format, I think really made for a better uh, initial uh, zine with Desert Moon of Karth and it actually got done. And then uh, the other, there's the uh, sort of crass commercial elements of some, enough people will buy the thing. Uh, I, I was thinking if I make it for Mothership to at least, uh, you know, break even. And um, it uh, did pretty good, uh, a little uh, more than breaking even. So that's sort of what got me started in publishing stuff for Mothership. And then I've uh, branched out into doing some um, publishing uh, other people's stuff for OSC and uh, working on a, a mega dungeon down the line as well. But primarily, I think um, I'm into publishing and writing for Mothership would be the majority of what Silver Arm is doing now. And so just tell us a little bit, uh, we'll get more into the, the actual game uh, design itself in a second. Just, yeah. uh, can you just tell us a little bit, like why um, in the, why Mothership? Like what, you talked a little bit about the community and like mm -hmm. different differing from Stars Without Number and, but why, why do you think Mothership has kind of taken off? Do you have any kind of sense of why yeah. that community in particular has grown so uh, mm -hmm. voraciously over the years? Yeah, I think there's a couple points uh, that have sort of converged to make it as uh, big of a sort of indie uh, system as it is. I think the first is the accessibility. Uh, it, the layout uh, is very nice, and the the con the rules content and uh, sort of flavor within those is packed into just a, a little uh, zine sort of uh, intro player's manual. There's also the other element, I think, is the um, sort of third party ethos of it, how the um, sort of creators like uh, Sean and Alan have been uh, very uh, open about encouraging third third party creators and sort of building that uh, ecosystem of awesome uh, modules. And I think that initial encouragement and support uh, and having a uh, being open to pe everyone taking their own spin on the system has made uh, really made a lot of cool content for it. And uh, also helped forge a community of really enthusiastic people who, you know, tell their friends about it and who also want to play uh, at their table as well. Um, it's also filling a niche, I think, that is um, there. There definitely when Mothership came out, uh, there that was pre, I think, pre Alien RPG, uh, pre Death in Space, and uh, even you know, with that's only three uh, systems that hit that sort of uh, gritty uh, blue collar sci fi horror. Uh, and I think there's plenty of space. You could have 10 systems doing that uh, because it's a rather, I think, popular genre and um, it's very underserved in RPGs. And I think Mothership really hits that sweet spot on uh, theming and accessibility and sort of uh, openness to uh, community content. And I think it's those things that have and a couple, probably some more that have led to it being sort of where it is, I guess. And so to bring up uh, Desert Moon of Karth again, you can see uh, the s kind of spaghetti Western vibes to it. Like, did you know going into it, like, this is exactly what I want to do? Or did you have that evolve over time as you were like making the, the sandbox setting? Yeah, I, I think I wanted Space Western from, uh, from the start. Uh, the level, of, I poured in more spaghetti over time uh, to the recipe. But uh, I just... Uh, Actually, I, I had a, a sector map uh, for my uh, campaign. I was running up Stars Without Number, and nothing uh, emerged identical. But I had these sort of planets in the sector, and it's like, what if I made a module on here? It's like, no, that's boring. And then I had a desert planet with weird psychic stuff and uh, orbital sort of uh, defense array in the sort of in the in the campaign. I was like, well, this could be interesting. And then it evolved into a tiny moon and. Uh, got the uh, space western elements and the um, ancient uh, civilization that's shattered and uh, the tribal park rangers and uh, alien sand squid. And it just sort of, I, I think, accrued like a snowball. And eventually uh, that snowball became a sort of a somewhat cohesive uh, uh, 
sort of module. And uh, yeah, I guess it accretion through um, just layering was how that worked. Like iteration. You mentioned, you mentioned uh, like you're in Nevada currently calling uh, in and you are mm -hmm. a park ranger. How much of your own experiences kind of flowed into the whole uh, design of the desert moon? Um, I'd say it, it definitely is uh, a really useful uh, job for getting uh, inspiration and sort of a, uh, uh, nature wilderness environments. And also, uh, you're, um, you have to read through a lot of different, like, uh, history, um, uh, elements about, uh, to best interpret the site you're at. Right. And, uh, a lot of that stuff is just ripe for, uh, stealing for RPG stuff and plugging in and, um, uh, the different sort of, uh, human conflicts and, uh, and, Ge geology it all can be i guess stolen and remixed and uh put in a blender and putting out a you can put out a tiny desert moon with it with it specifically i i definitely um for the uh lunar rangers i i drew uh, a little more directly from sort of my experience with it it's it's not a no not really a commentary on the, the park service or anything like that it's just uh definitely written with some familiarity to try to have a, a weird spin on something I, I knew about. On a side note, did, did you happen to see, I think there's somebody put out like a fake, a fictitious brochure on mm -hmm. um, like that living organism, um, oh. giant living organism uh, under like, it was like a fake parks brochure. Whoa, the flesh pit national yeah. park place. Yeah. I, I've seen that. It's, it's cool. And it, they, they definitely nail that style of like, and here is the acid geyser. Yeah. <laughs> yeah cool. well, that's like ripe for game, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, so as we go through uh, with the the scrolling through, we're, we don't have to do a deep dive into it, but just sure. kind of as we're going through, and uh, I know a lot of people comment how much they like this faction diagram of mm -hmm. explaining kind of how the factions like work together or work against each other and like what their goals and relationships are. Um, how much of it was kind of you going, like, do you do the layout yourself? Uh, so I do not do the layout myself on this one. This is a uh, Simeon Cogswell and their work is, uh, excellent. Um, okay. with, uh, however, the, with the diagrams like this, what I do is I use, uh, what's the name of it? I use an app, uh, called Scapple, uh, which is basically, it's, it, there's a lot of other ways of doing it, but it's just a, uh, mind map type thing where, you write things in a box and then you can drag a line to connect them and say stuff on the line. And that that's, it's usually, um, I'll send one of those uh, to whoever I'm working with uh, on layout as a sort of rough of my idea. And then they turn it into something that's actually aesthetically pleasant and uh, blends with the, the zine. Well, that's cool. And actually I, I would have to say, it does not strike me as like uh, you handing over the graphic design to somebody else it's like you guys have really uh meshed mm -hmm. well between your content and the the overall layout because often i see like just template kind of design when people usually just write and they hand it off to a designer sometimes you don't get that yeah. creative layout which i think you succeeded very well at with uh, karth between the content that you're coming up mm -hmm. with and the layout it all works very well together so yeah they really uh, blew it out of the park i'm yeah. very um, how it turned out yeah, I've seen on your blog post when you talk about the the at the top of this the if the players do nothing in the future state of the desert moon yeah. Parth, and I I think you mentioned uh, uh, deep carbon observatory being one of the, yeah. the inspirations for that. Mm -hmm. Um, how, when you look at the OSR and just all the innovation kind of taking place in the different areas, how how what inspires you from it as far as like who's making some really cool stuff, like different products that you've seen that you go, Oh, I just love the way they're approaching this. In, in just generally, or in terms of uh, sort of future timelines. Well, just, no, just, uh, just in general. Like, I mean, I, I just, as we're going through this, there's things yeah. that like, I know that you've talked about in the past mm -hmm. um, from your blog, uh, sure. which people should uh, check out. I'll have all the links in the, the yeah. description, but just kind of like, you're in the space, you mm -hmm. see a lot of cool OSR kind of design, like what kind of innovations have you seen in the last few years that you go like, this is so cool. Let's see. I, I think um, the, uh, a big sort of thing that's uh, a couple, uh, a couple bits, a, a big thing that's become uh, more common is a, 
is a, a certain level of minimalism and terseness in, in keying things and writing descriptions. And um, I, I definitely am someone who likes some, some level of, uh, of prose, like uh, in sentence form. Uh, and, and you can go all the way to uh, like the OSE house style with the keywords, which is very, uh, very user-friendly and quick. Um, but even if you're doing sentences, you can take eight sentences, turn them to four or turn them to three. And I think uh, looking for uh, the uh, the key um, sort of core of what you're trying to say is going to benefit any type of product. And uh, as long as uh, you're not shaving down whatever makes that uh, that entry or that key or that description sort of tick. And some uh, people I think have been doing that really good. It's Gavin Norman with OSC. And then also um, the key style of uh, Brad Kerr in uh, a lot of his adventures. I, I really uh, have uh, been inspired by the style uh, they have as well. And uh, so that's, that's a big development. Um, what else is, is really cool going on? Um, I've, I've really liked the control page uh, spread thing that's uh, going on. And that's, I've, I guess, stolen from, I don't know who came up with that, but it's, it's common in mothership and Ben Milton stuff. And, uh, just having all the information on one page spread, I think is really important for accessibility. Um, and then finally, uh, I think in terms of the way things are designed, there's a lot of ways of going about it. And someone who um, I really like their work as well is uh, on that regard is uh, coins and squirrels or scurples uh, with like the monster overhaul and kidnap the arch priest. And uh, the philosophy of, I've heard them say on a, a blog post is that uh, they have the soul of a um, refrigerator manual writer, which is, I think, a, a useful uh, thing to take into making RPG books because um, it's really it's important that you care about the material, that it's creative, that it, it has juice to it. But once you once you get that, once you have that that core nugget of awesome, I think it's delivering that to other people in an accessible form. That's important. And I really don't think anything will suffer from making it. Uh, more accessible or better laid out. Uh, I don't think uh, there's there's nothing but benefits there, and um, that's something like I've striven to emulate from a lot of people. Sort of uh, making the handy, uh, usable at the table uh, RPG modules. And when you uh, first thought of like the the concept of the Desert Moon in the graphic design and layout and the illustration, did you know it was going to end up like this? Were you searching for uh, illustrators that could convey this kind of look or did you, it, did it evolve over time? Yeah, I, it, it did evolve over time, but eventually uh, I think a lot of the look of Desert Moon of Karth um, uh, was uh, shaped by uh, Logan Stahl who did the cover art and the, a lot of the um, images that sort of, um, uh, comic book graphic novel uh, style and with the uh, sort of retro uh, line work. And then also uh, images like this is seen by uh, Francisco uh, Zaneri. And I think uh, their um, they're different styles paired well, but I, I guess I, I wanted to lean for something that was uh, retro. Like the font is definitely, uh, it's inspired by uh, old uh, TSR modules and also um, uh, the layout on Hot Springs Island was a big inspiration uh, for me as well. Uh, but also something that didn't feel like it was shackled to the past. Like, uh, I think it's Im Im important that it, things have their own identity. And I'm not just trying to, um, you know, emulate some uh, golden uh, forgotten past, right? Uh, but there's, yeah. there's a lot of cool stuff to take from that golden forgotten past, right? And uh, sort of uh, shape into whatever... Uh, you um, you want for your products. Well, as we uh, flip through this, you can see it just like it's just a fun kind of like every page is different and every page has like a little bit of uh, it's like a, I always like to refer to it almost like a Where's Waldo or like yeah. uh, Grew the Adventurer. Uh, yeah. Some of those like old style illustrations where you can kind of like get into the world and you kind of feel like you're part of it. And every page is like has such small details that it's just fascinating to kind of explore mm -hmm. yeah glenn, glenn seal did a great job on the maps uh, some somebody uh, told me uh somewhere they said that uh, this is really great for my adhd and how uh, how i read a manual because when i'm looking at one thing i can jump over here and it's something slightly different and you can really sort of explore around and uh hopefully uh also 
it's not too chaotic of a jungle that it's also useful to uh, to parse. Well, I think I think you guys did a great job. And were you surprised at the uh, success of it? Oh yeah, definitely. I was I was hoping like, well, if I can make like I don't know four thousand bucks, then uh, then I guess my time was you know used used all right uh, that I was uh, working on this for, and uh, I it did significantly better and got a. A, a bunch of people um, who are interested in it. And I'm always uh, super happy and uh, uh, stoked whenever I hear somebody is playing or getting a, a good uh, session out of Desert Moon of Karth and like uh, having like cool experiences with that. I think that's awesome. And uh, I've, I've been hearing that from uh, more people than I originally expected. And when did you come up with the Sand Squid? Um, it's when I was like, well, I'm taking a lot from Dune, but I can't do sandworms because that would be too Dune. Uh, so what I, I basically spent a good like part, chunk of an evening having like sand and then being like, I could have sand rats. No. What about giant <laughs> sand snakes? No, that's too much like a worm. And uh, it, it basically just slotted in. It was, well, sand squid, you know, it's sort of a kraken type thing, but in the sand. And so that sort of fills a similar niche, but is a little weirder, I think, and has its own thing going on. So there wasn't so uh, super in-depth a uh, genesis of them, but they just sort of evolved from that silly sort of nugget. Cool. And uh, so you had the success with uh, Desert Moon of uh, Karth, and then uh, as you're getting ready for your next project, like how did the abilities considered unnatural kind of flow out? Yeah, I, I was spitballing things with uh, my good friend uh, Danny. And uh, I just had a couple nuggets. We were trying to do a collaborative uh, type thing for this one. And there's a couple different ideas that are just a couple sentences. And I had one that was, uh, what if we did like a Jedi cult that's, uh, or, you know, it's not officially a Jedi cult trademark, you know, don't come after me, uh, mouse. But, uh, you know, we had some psychic uh, space warriors uh, that were, and we just take that sort of that element, that sort of culty order bit and sort of dial that up for horror. And then uh, over time, the sort of uh, uh, workers uh, sort of oppressed by a mining corporation element came into that. And then we layered in some uh, inspiration from like Caverns of Thracia and uh, dungeon crawl and stuff for a sort of temple crawl adventure that uh, we tried to make uh, sort of sandboxy as well for how you approach it with uh, the faction dynamics. And that just also accreted over time. And that was a cool process uh, working with someone else on a, the throughout the entire thing. It can be, I think, sometimes hard to merge two minds on ideas. But uh, when you get there, I think it results in something really cool uh, because you get sort of that uh, hybridization of ideas and people fill in uh, gaps uh, in, with their own cool ideas. And I think that was a lot of fun. And uh, then the next project, uh, Secret of Black Crag um, for OSE, yeah. is that something that, uh, like, are you kind of in both worlds where you love your mothership and OSE exactly. and like I love classic them both. OSR? I don't, don't make me pick a favorite kid, basically. Uh, but it's because I, I really like, uh, I'm running a campaign of OSC uh, as well right now. I really like that sort of the old school uh, fantasy sort of basic D and D uh, basis for things, and I, I think it's a it's nice to have a cer certain I guess framework that then other games can you know depart from as a, a as a loose lingua franca that things uh, evolve from. And so I actually have a, I got the physical copies here today, and oh, they, cool. they worked out. They they exist, which is uh, a lot <laughs> off of my uh, um, off of my back, but. Um, and, yeah, I love OSC. So the Kickstarter was like it's delivering right now. I think I saw on your Kickstarter yeah. update where it, like it is out in the mail right now. Is that correct? Yes, we're, we're getting we're starting to get them uh, shipped out and, and packaged. Gary, Gary Khan is going to slow things down a little bit as uh, my distributor is going there too. But uh, it's it's our first sort of priority now. They exist. That's it. Just needs to go to doorsteps now. So that's uh, you've got me on record on, on that. If if the truck explodes or whatever. Um, <laughs> But um, yeah, I love OSC. It's been a lot of fun. And then this one was my first time publishing uh, something. So I, I didn't write this. This is Chance Dude and X at work. And um, I'm, I'm a huge fan of uh, what Chance has, has done. Uh, previously, it was uh, uh, the Black Worm of Brandon's uh, which is, uh, you know, sort of got around as one of the uh, 
I think it's one of the, the most recommended uh, starter OSR uh, adventures. Uh, and it's a lot of that has to do, I think, with uh, Chance's ability to balance sort of neat, evocative um, uh, nuggets within a sort of sandbox setting that also feels interconnected and sort of uh, has a certain baseline uh, and then departs from that in interesting ways, but also calls back to uh, familiar uh, folklore or pop culture or pulp uh, stuff when I, I think uh, they're very, uh, he's great at making uh, sandboxes. Yeah. And uh, one of your blog posts that kind of jumped out at me was you talked about uh, using uh, hooks within the sandbox or hex crawl settings. Mm -hmm. And I saw your diagram, which I was like, oh, that's a little complicated. But yeah. when I dove into it, I was like, yeah, this makes a lot of sense. And so maybe you can just summarize what your that blog post was and mm -hmm. how do you use that now in all your kind of sandbox setting approaches? Yeah, I, I try to, and um, and and stuff that I'm, I'm publishing, I, I try to uh, in my sort of uh, edit, you know, uh, editorial role, try to push for that type of thing too. Uh, where basically the idea is uh, is that all of your locations in a sandbox. That's great. It's good to have a lot of locations in a sandbox. It's awesome, uh, but if they're not connected to each other, if there's no sort of interconnectivity to this, you don't really have a skeleton or a framework. You just have a loose nebulous clouds of here's here's the goblin village and here's the crashed spaceship and here's the um, you know ancient uh, fort fallen to ruin occupied by pilgrims. Uh, but if you start drawing hooks between all of these places, uh, then you rapidly make a interconnected feeling place. And they, they can be simple as uh, you know somebody wants to deliver uh, this. Uh, the, the body of their, their fallen sort of comrade to this location. But in this location, they've been suffering from the uh, ravaging of the beast that lives in the hill, which is in this hex or, or this point. And uh, I think it's, and you can do that, but it's a pretty simple process. You just look at a location and um, I've seen a, a couple different ways uh, people do it. You either can just say, okay, here's one connection, or you could roll like a D4 or D6 and say, D6 could be a lot of locations, but let's say you have three, two to four connections for each hex or a location between other locations. And then uh, you don't have to um, flesh the, this out all that much. You definitely can if you have the time. But in just doing that part, you have a, a sort of a magnetic network of hooks where you move to one spot or you've got something pulling you somewhere else. And then you're there, you've got something pulling you somewhere else. And maybe you loop back to somewhere you already uh, were for a different reason. And I think that level, that sort of um, uh, that pull around the sandbox, I think helps makes it somewhere interesting as opposed to, well, I guess we can go north. There might be desert there. Or we'll go south uh, because I like the direction south. I think having meaningful um, information to make the choices on in a sandbox really helps make it feel um, impactful and like uh, your choices have um, uh, matter in navigating it. Is that and, a sort uh, of summary? And it creates a, I always mess up, ver verisimilitude, sure. I think is the correct uh, term, where mm -hmm. you feel like you're actually in the game. And uh, because mm -hmm. it just feels like realistic, like you would encounter that in real life, mm -hmm. as if you were out adventuring. And so I thought it was a really good post. People should, once again, check that out. I'll put all the links in the uh, descriptions. And then uh, you did a, also a, a Karth Jam uh, kind of yeah, recently. Yeah. Yeah, and that was this, that was this, kind of fun. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. And uh, like, how many entries did you get in total? And uh, like, w were you surprised? Because just for those that maybe didn't yeah. see it or weren't aware of it, you basically said, "Okay, make some products that would go into this Desert Moon of Karth setting." Mm -hmm. um, and were you surprised at the content and like the kind of creativity that came with it? Yeah, now I was. It's really cool to uh, see other people take something that you've made and put their spin on it or, or their addition and uh, their voice. And I think it's uh, all the ideas were super creative. It was about um, five, five, and, uh, five and a half entries um, or so, and all of them are really interesting and uh, I think uh, cool to add to sort of the world of Karth. And I also think it's uh, good evidence that it's it's good for everyone to share things because um, I, I know some uh, some folks and definitely a lot of companies are really 
stingy on their IP. They try to hoard it all. And, uh, you know, I guess there's some benefits to hoarding your, your IP. But uh, there's a lot of benefits besides just it being a friendly thing to do, I think, uh, to, to sharing things. Because sort of like I mentioned with Mothership, uh, the, the, op the, the openness towards third-party creations and uh, flexibility with that led to a lot of content. And in just me telling, and this is a much smaller scale, right? It's only five uh, things, but just telling people, hey, for this, you can just use whatever you want from Karth. Like, I'm not going to sue you for using Sanskrit or or uh, you know the proper nouns or whatever. Just just do your thing, and um, it led to some really cool stuff. And hopefully, that's cool for me too because it makes people more interested in uh, getting into Karth, and uh, everybody wins. I think. I've uh, always wondered if. Uh somebody that made a third party product made a better product than the original. It's almost like doing a cover mm -hmm. tune uh, better than the original yeah. <laughs> artist. But to be honest with you, I don't think I've ever seen that happen. Um, when like people make the original product and it's mm -hmm. like always usually like really solid. That's why people want to make for it. And uh, yeah, make I mean, if, if somebody makes a better version in Desert Moon Cart, then they deserve to have more people <laughs> uh, like buy their thing than my thing. Uh, and then, uh, more recently, uh, you've announced announced, or you will be launching uh, the Tide World of Manny, uh, yeah, which yeah. I'll, I'll bring that up on the screen here. This looks Very super cool. It's another mothership um, sandbox setting. Uh, tell us a little bit about it. Sure. So Tide World of Manny, is, it's the, very much the spiritual uh, sequel to Desert Moon of Karth. Um, it's, it's a sort of uh, mid-revolution uh, nautical sandbox set around this uh, last atoll which is the only spit of island uh in this entire sort of uh, ocean world that's sort of uh stuck on uh tidally locked so it's in an eternal sunset as well which makes it uh it very aesthetically uh pretty with the cover um but also it's it's got a lot of faction intrigue and um i'm working on a, a similar sort of a sandbox system to Karth uh, with uh, several uh, locations of interest uh, and inter cross interacting NPCs, and also trying to uh, use a bit of a sort of evolving uh, revolution phase element to it, where over time uh, things will change and um, uh, adapt based on the progression of this revolution and the end result of uh, who comes out on top or if the revolution uh, happens will depend based on the actions of the. Uh, the factions and also of the of the party as well, and this it's also the type of thing uh, people can entirely ignore, and they can just sail around and do some uh, hover train heists or go fishing for coelacanth or um, explore ancient ruins as well. And I, I think uh, I'm really coming at it at that uh, perspective of here's a here's a a box of of toys and it, here's a situation and what you want to do with the situation, even if it's just stopping by for one shore leap and then going back to your uh, horrifying mothership adventures. I think I'm happy with that and people should get their um, sort of gaming value out of uh, exploring the setting that way. And, and you pointed out to me, if I go back, if, so if everybody looks at the cover, which is on the left side of this screen, mm -hmm. and then uh, we go back to the um, thumbnail, the yeah. desert world of Manny, and you can see the color change in the sky. And so, you know, in game design, the, the evolution of your product as you're going mm -hmm. through it, can you just kind of touch on that for us? Yeah, specifically, I just the, go, the, oh, the, the sunset and oh, yeah. So, originally, I had that if, if you tab over that sort of blue sky uh, work on it done, which um, I just it no reason for it. I just wanted something a little, little lighter and uh. Uh, than the sort of night of the Karth uh, cover. But then I was reading up on tidally locked planets and how cool they are, how, and depends on how um, uh, you interpret like the, the weather dynamics. But one potential uh, way that looks is that you have one part that's entirely frozen. And then the other part that has an eternal storm where uh, the um, sort of uh, the heat of the sun is causing sort of ev evaporation, a lot of uh, complex sort of weather systems. And then in the middle, you'd have a more sort of stable uh, area as well uh, that was a uh, better temperature and less uh, stormy. And um, that definitely leads to some awesome uh, world building uh, possibilities and um, helps explain uh, the reason why, well, 
there's only it's a whole world, but there's sort of only one spit of land on it, and then a couple, a few locations of interest outside of that. And most of that is due to the constraints of the medium. I, I want to make a a sort of tight module instead of a, um, a you know 600 page gazetteer. And uh, I think it's also a diegetic with this sort of setting. It fits. And uh, yeah, it led to some cool art as well. If everything's sort of an eternal sunset, then it leads to some sort of interesting dynamics of how this society works. Like, how do you know it's day? Uh, what do you use to set the time? And um, it's definitely dr the biggest inspirations for it were uh, Mad Max and Waterworld with a lean towards Waterworld for sure. And um, just trying to have a, a wet version of Desert Moon of Karth. Um, and I, you know, once again, like so the artwork that I, I have here up on the screen, one of the things that, that I really liked about Karth is that it felt alien, but familiar, but it wasn't a ripoff of any kind of particular society. Like I know you got inspiration from spaghetti Westerns and the Western kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But when you look at some of the artwork, like it really does feel like when I was a kid, I'd see some sci-fi books that were just like, it wasn't like a spin off of like an existing mm -hmm. culture. Like it, these look very much kind of just like an alien world, whether it's the fashion or the architecture. So um, how much direction do you give the artists as far as like what you're looking for? And what, what kind of process iterative process do you mm -hmm. go through in deciding all this? Yeah, usually I have a, a brief uh, and then these are illustrations by Logan Stahl. Um, I have a brief like where here's what I want. Uh, here's the elements I, I want inside of this. And I try not to be super specific. Like this one would have like a one sentence, like undersea grotto to the uh, the wave priests uh, sort of flanked by sort of preaching um, mural in the back uh, of the uh, a generation ship on land and then some, some guards uh, and then the direction uh, sort of aesthetically that it takes is uh, sort of on uh, Logan. And uh, I definitely try to provide some general, like for the world, here's some of the cultural influences and uh, aesthetic sort of touchstones uh, that I want to see like in the blend. And then um, it's really cool just uh, letting whoever's doing the art uh, just sort of take it from there and put their spin on it. And then I'll uh, add some things or, or tweak some things to better fit the sort of world as it's uh, visualized through the art sometimes. And this one, I couldn't help but notice there is a bit of a Blade Runner kind of vibe to it and the, mm -hmm. the, the stands and, but uh, yeah. you got the publicans and the water world and uh, um, fish obviously probably being a main staple of their diet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was definitely, I, it's, it's loose. And I think uh, in the way I do sort of, I guess, sci-fi world building is I, I try not to, um, I don't know, get too lost in the weeds and try to think about the history of like, uh, where where on earth are people uh, coming from and what's the exact sort of um, uh, sort of cultural heritage or uh, or the nature of the society and go off of a mixture of like, does this seem vaguely plausible? It's like, OK, and then we'll, we'll mix uh, some cultural influences like Sweden, Japan, uh, Mad Mad Max, whatever. Uh, I guess that's Australia. And uh, <laughs> then just um, see where the artist takes that and then adapt sort of some of the uh, setting as well. But um, it's, I, I think there's a, a fine balance to between being very specific with what you want out of the world for an RPG uh, thing, but also being flexible and uh, having the vibes be foremost. Like, uh, you know, you don't need a giant ship in the middle of the city that doesn't necessarily, uh, it's not important to the functioning of, of a I, uh, isolated colony on a sea world, but it looks cool. And so then you can uh, sort of justify things and do a world building to make that uh, uh, matter from there. And with any good um, sea world, you got to have pirates, right? Oh, sure. It's required. And so it, what uh, alien creature is that up in the top right? So um, that's a, uh, what uh, I'm calling the holy divers there, which are in a sort of order of uh, mutants who um, are uh, both uh, are shunned by some factions and revered by, by others as well. And basically they're, they're uh, people who um, have been genetically altered and who can breathe underwater and uh, have sort of a, a different uh, appearance. Cool. 
and um, I take it, you've got some ship admirals and you can see the coral uh, uh, yeah. leaflets or whatever they're called on the shoulder pads. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's the land baron over there. And then we've got the map uh, that uh, Ben Smith uh, was working on. And it's uh, not quite finalized, but it's pretty close. And that's going to be a, a spread in the book. And you can see there's there's a lot of uh, location and detail uh, sort of crammed into the the format of the book. Yeah, that's super cool. And you can see the, the ship palace that we, we saw like highlights of in one of those illustrations. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you do your world building, how how much uh, fun compared to the writing part of it and just thinking about the concepts? What's what's your favorite part of the whole process of like designing your world? Do you have these like light bulb moments where you go, oh, sunset okay now i've now i figured something else and it just streamlines the whole process yeah i think it's a combination of like beating my head against the wall and then occasionally the wall breaks and uh, there's something cool on the other side of the wall um and then you have sort of things move in sort of bounds and then there'll be periods of refinement on the idea and the setting and the adventure content and then sometimes you just get a at least i've found i, I just get a a cool idea free from something that I, I overhear or I'm watching. And then uh, sometimes they lead to a, uh, they're a great nugget to build off of and uh, scaffold maybe a whole section of the uh, adventure from. And when does this go to Kickstarter? Like what's the plan for okay. how you're launching this? So this will be launching on Kickstarter on March 29th, uh, right after I get back from GaryCon. And um, I'm really stoked uh, to get started. I think I've uh, set myself up from previous Kickstarters to not stress myself up uh, that much on the first day uh, compared to uh, my n norm of just refreshing every, you know, second <laughs> and, you know, staring at the screen till my eyes bleed. Well, it's always scary when you hit like go and then you're just like waiting to see if you've messed up on something or if there's mm -hmm. a typo or yeah, like, exactly. you're like, oh, so it's a lot of stress for uh, designers, but your last uh, one funded very quickly and, um, it seems like you have a really good track record of producing and delivering on your products in a timely fashion. Do you have lots of interesting stretch goals or are you just keeping it simple? Oh, I've got some stretch goals. I'm, I'm trying to lean towards uh, simplicity, but uh, depending on how much you know money people throw at the project, I've got some things I've sort of uh, figured out logistically I can add to the book uh, or uh, features that will um, make it a little more juicy, like a, a hover train heist generator or making a wraparound cover or increasing the quality of the book. But uh, I think it's important, like um, a lot of folks have seen from Kickstarters, to make sure that the the core thing is the core thing and that uh, anything that I add to that won't detract from it. Like, I'm getting tired world out to people quick. And any kind of advice as far as like uh, designers that are like, you know, you started off with Karth, I think it was done through drive through RPG. Yeah. Um, is, you know, keep keep it simple. And mm -hmm. now are you doing offset printing elsewhere? Yeah, so I'm, I'm doing uh, offset printing uh, for uh, Secret of the Black Cry. And I'm actually looking into, um, I'm planning on doing Tide World of Mani as a hardcover as well, uh, offset. And uh, specifically, sort of advice on printing for people, you were saying? Yeah, yeah. Like, it, like if you, uh, because that's always one of the biggest challenges is like the printing. Yes and the shipping, like how do you, yes. how have you kind of evolved in your process? Okay. Yeah. I've got some hard one advice on that. Um, so uh, the, the first step I think is to uh, figure out an idea of like how big the project's going to be. And uh, for like an initial thing, uh, basically the number of uh, units of the book or zine that you're making uh, will depend, will uh, change how cost effective it is to do a variety of methods. So if you're doing, let's say, less than a thousand of something, it's definitely worth it to do like print on demand or like a digital printing service like Mixum or Uprint uh, where you can have that flexibility and the you're not going to see any benefits from going to like a traditional printing type model because there, there's an initial fixed cost of setting that up. And so it's going to cost a lot to print a few things. Uh, but as you uh, uh, do Kickstarters or do uh, sell things or however you're uh, getting your thing out there uh, that get into, well, maybe I'm going to make more than a thousand of these or 2000 for sure. Uh, you want to look into um, traditional printers because the, the price per unit on like a hardcover uh, can be um, 
affordable compared to printing a, a small zine uh, sort of digitally, just because uh, they can make, once they have it set up, it's easy for them to run a lot of them. And then you have something that might be a little cooler, a little more solid in the hand as well. Uh, so my advice basically is uh, starting out, it's really good to uh, work with things that have low um, investment required. So print on demand is great on drive through especially because it lets people have access to your, uh, your book, your zine uh, from wherever, and uh, they can get it from the same place. They get the PDF uh, for a lot of folks. Uh, the downside is the, they don't have, they, they only have a perfect bound. They don't have staple bound. They're not going to sell it. So um, the quality will be a, a little less, although I've been pretty happy with print on demand stuff. And they do have a weird specific layout things that will require their own custom layout uh, for drive through. So that's going to take uh, some work and time on your part if you want to do that. Um, and uh, yeah, for uh, digital printing, basically, uh, I'd say the amount you should print is, and you'll hear different advice on this. Uh, and I, I could, uh, other people will have valid uh, perspectives as well. But I print uh, at least a double of whatever you know that you're going to um, uh, sell of this thing because uh, eventually you'll be able to, and this is the number you know, not the number you hope, double what you know you're going to sell of this, whatever um, you've got locked in, um, to double, and then you'll be able to sell those off for a while afterwards, and that'll give you enough time to get another print run, uh, whichever method you want. Yeah. And uh, you had mentioned uh, you're going to uh, GaryCon. Um, yes. So if I remember correctly from your blog, that GaryCon mm -hmm. was the first convention that you had actually gone to? And I think, um, did I, or was it I mean, maybe second. I went to Gen Con first, but, uh, and Gen Con I had a good time at, but GaryCon I enjoyed a lot more. I really like a, a sort of small convention and uh, it's, it's a nice blend of people, you know, who are back in the day in the 1970s writing RPGs and families and people who just got into indie RPGs recently and OSR stuff and classic stuff and uh, plenty of 5e uh, stuff as well. So I, I like the scale of the convention and I made some friends there. And so I'm stoked to go back. I definitely recommend it to folks. Um, I'm interested in exploring some of the other small ones like Gary Con or North Texas Con as well. But it you know depends on schedule and um, uh, logistics for sure. And you're you're not going to do a booth or anything there. It's just uh, showing up. And are you running any games? So yeah, I'll be running some games. Uh, they're currently uh, I've they filled up really quick, uh, funnily. But I'm going to be uh, doing some free gaming as well, just walking around. And I'll have my stuff for sale at the World of Game Designs booth, um, where they're they're running the booth and selling it. And um, they're my distributor as well, and which is very nice for me because I get to go to the con and not have to staff the booth, which is great. I can just drop in and say hi. So they're doing me a solid uh, because I get to enjoy it and do some gaming. But yeah, I'm uh, excited to get there. Cool, and then I couldn't help but notice in one of your uh, the Black Crag update, uh, there's another mm -hmm. product I saw hinted at, the Pyre of Kalon Moss. What's that oh, all yeah. about? So that, that is now, uh, that's out and available on drive Um Yep, so it's a the expansion thing, it was a, uh, add on to the secret of the black Craig, uh, which folks can, um, who uh, didn't back it can just pick up on its own on drive through or, uh, and basically what it is, it's a, um, pamphlet adventure I wrote on a, um, ghost whale ship that has risen once more, uh, from the, the depths and, uh, it's haunted by the, uh, for eternally tormented ghost of the captain, uh, Kalon Moss, who is, uh, hunting down this, uh, this ghost whale on the ship that he just uh, he can't bring down and so the players can come on to this uh, sort of cursed ship and uh for whichever uh, hook has gotten them there arresting the spirit of the captain or just looting the place before it uh enters this endless cycle of burning to the ground again and sinking below the waves until the next moon and um, it's just a little brochure adventure but uh, i think i was able to um pull off a um fun dungeon experience that also has a evolution over time the longer you spend there cool and so i guess that leads to my question of well what is next for you after obviously mm -hmm. you've got a kickstarter on the horizon right now but yes. uh, where do you see yourself are you going to do more mothership more ose like where's mm -hmm. your passion lie so i think uh, primarily uh, for silver arm what we're going to focus on what i'm focusing on is uh, a mothership and ose 
And then I'm keeping my eye open uh, for uh, interest in other OSR systems uh, because it, it's a, a question of, A, number one, I need to enjoy the system. I need to like playing it. I need to like writing it. I need to like modules other people write for it. And then the other thing is um, sort of uh, viability, like how many people want to buy stuff for this. Uh, so if I enjoy it, enjoy it and uh, nobody's uh, interested in picking stuff up, then I wouldn't really pursue it. But um, I'm keeping my eyes open to other uh, OSR and adjacent systems as well. But primarily uh, OSC and Mothership are uh, the focus. The next thing, um, I've got a, a secret book on the horizon that is um, uh, written by uh, someone else, a notable uh, OSR author. And um, I don't know if there's uh, too much to announce right now, other than it's going to be a, it's going to be a big sandbox. It's hardcover, and I'm looking for the the scope of it. Uh, should be a couple hundred pages, which will be the largest thing that uh, we've uh, done so far. But I'm really excited about it and think it'll uh, fit well with the the past products as well. Then after that, I've got my mega dungeon sometime I've been working on uh, in a sort of volcano and uh, sandbox setting. But uh, that one's sort of the, um, you know, back burner project uh, when you have something of that scale. So it'll come out eventually, but there'll be a couple things before then. And I think we chatted on uh, my Discord uh, server, uh, Daika mm -hmm. Games Discord server, about the Dungeon 23. And I said, I wonder how many people are actually going to yeah. <laughs> follow yeah. through on that. Because you know, now's a good time to, to talk because it seems like it's got a little quieter. But what I've been seeing, the people still working on it, um, uh, they're, they're making cool stuff. But yeah, I, I know I, I got seven days in or six days in. And now I've got like a good chunk of a dungeon I'll use eventually. But I just um, it didn't fit my uh, my my brain in terms of uh, my ability to commit to that daily. I think it's really cool and useful. I just uh, I fell out a little bit. Yeah, I think it works when it's like an October, like Inktober type of thing mm -hmm. where it's just one month. I think people can yeah. commit to that. But every single day, it's uh, yeah, it takes a special kind of person to have the dedication to uh, adjust their yearly schedule for it. Yeah, that's for sure. But uh, anyways, Joel, I just want to say, you know, thanks for coming on the show. I really like your work. Uh, I like the direction that you're heading in and all the all the ideas that you have coming at you. And um, I really, really look forward to uh, seeing um, the uh, Tide world come to life. Yeah. It's going to be exciting. I'm stoked too. Thanks for having me on. Always a pleasure. <laughs>